Hi, welcome back to an introduction to the discrete Fourier transform. This is lecture four where we try to understand the math behind the discrete Fourier transform. I want to do a quick recap of the previous lectures. Uh, in the first lecture, we introduced the discrete Fourier transform and then right away apply it with using Python. Uh, we analyze and read in uh, audio files and then we were able to mathematically and or pro programmatically uh, determine what note or chord is played on an instrument. And it's really amazing that uh, that this is possible with just only a few lines of Python code. Uh, and then in lecture two, we talked about uh, digital audio basics, uh, digital sampling and sampling rate, and how any signal is uh, simply a sum of different uh, frequency sinusoids. Uh, this includes a uh, music piece or our voice, uh, any, uh, any audio signal. And we discussed that uh, the way we perceive uh, uh, frequency, uh, the pitch is the way that we perceive uh, frequency, and that uh, that this is this perception is based on the log scale, and then uh, we saw that the discrete Fourier transform converts the sample, which is on the time domain representation. It's a bunch of sample that depends on time. Uh, the discrete Fourier transform convert that representation to uh, the frequency domain representation, and the point was that uh, it's harder to read the information from the time domain representation but it's much easier to read the information from the frequency domain representation. And the inverse discrete Fourier transform converts uh, it back so that, that this transform is invertible. And then in lecture three, we talk about aliasing and the Nyquist frequency. Aliasing occurs when there, is, there are high frequency components in the signal uh, relative to the sampling rate. And so the point is that if we don't sample at a high enough rate, we might have a high frequency that that cause distortion in our in our recording. Uh, we had an animation that explains this aliasing, uh, and then the the sampling theorem uh, discuss how we can overcome this problem. And the key is that if we can sample uh, so that the highest frequency component in the signal is less than or equal to half of the sampling rate, which we call the Nyquist frequency. As long as this is true, then our sampling will be accurate, and our recording will be an accurate recording. And then the fundamental frequency and the harmonics is the key to everything. In fact, the discrete Fourier transform detect uh, integer multiples of the fundamental frequency uh, up to uh, the Nyquist frequency. And so if any of this is unfamiliar or if you want to know more, please watch the, uh, those uh, lectures. Okay, so let's talk about the, this discrete Fourier transform. So here's the, the full formulation of uh, this transform. So we have a continuous signal, y of t. This is a function of time on some uh, interval from 0 to L, so maybe a small audio clip. And we want to sample the signal at some sampling rate called Fs. And uh, we're going to sample it so that we get n total samples. And so we're going to label these uh, discrete samples y0, y1, up to y of n minus 1. So the first one is index 0 up to index n minus 1. And so typically, the standard uh, sampling rate is 44,100 hertz. Um, we we'll talked about why that was in the previous video. And, uh, and so if we sample at that rate, then that gives you a CD quality sampling. So here's a picture of, uh, so again, our continuous function. This is a function of maybe the voltage uh, picked up from the microphone. And we, we sample them so that we get uh, an array of discrete sample values. And this array is digital audio. Digital audio is just basically an array of numbers. And so, so this array of numbers we have here, if we play it, then we hear audio. In fact, we did that in the first lecture. OK, here's the discrete Fourier transform. So again, we have this uh, array of numbers. And notice that if I multiply the sampling rate by the length of the audio, that gives us the total number of samples, uh, the n samples. And so the discrete Fourier transform uh, is a frequency detector. It attempts to detect any frequency component in the signal. And so how does it do this? Well, we look at uh, frequencies that it can detect. And the, the fundamental frequency is a frequency uh, of 1 over L. So again, L is the period of this, uh, this function. <coughs> and so this frequency, we take 1 over L. Uh, it's the, uh, the frequency that basically complete one cycle in this interval of time. Um, and another way of computing the fundamental frequency is uh, take the sampling rate divided by n. And so this is the fundamental frequency. The DFT detects 
integer multiples of this fundamental frequency. So, zero multiple of uh, the fundamental, the fundamental frequency, two times it, three times it, four times it. These are all integer multiple uh, of the fundamental, all the way to n minus one multiple. Um, and so, uh, the DFT allow us to kind of see whether these frequencies are present in the signal. Okay, so how does it do this? Well, it does, it does this by taking our sample, our n sample, and convert it into also an n, uh, n, uh, n numbers, but these are n complex numbers. These numbers are called the Fourier coefficients. And so again, our samples, our n samples, convert it to, um, to n complex numbers uh, using the same index, uh, where these complex numbers, y of k, expresses the degree to which the frequency f of k, which is k uh, multiple, so k is an integer, uh, k times the fundamental frequency. So again, this yk, the Fourier coefficient yk, tell you the degree to which this frequency, this k multiple of the fundamental, uh, how much of it occurs in the original signal. Uh, specifically, this transform is given by this formula. So again, it's our n sample converted to our Fourier, Fourier coefficients. Uh, by this uh, summation. So we take each of the sample, y0 to yn minus 1, and you multiply by this complex exponential. So this is a complex number. i is a uh, square root of negative 1. Uh, and, and so we have to talk about this in a second, but we multiply each of the sample with uh, each of these complex exponential, uh, and then we, we add them together, and that gives us the, uh, the Fourier coefficient. And that gives us one Fourier coefficient. We have to repeat this uh, summation for each of those uh, Fourier coefficient. And so if you were to program this, this is really simple. It's just a for loop that add up a bunch of numbers. Uh, and then if you want to compute all the Fourier coefficient, it's simply a, a nested loops. So in the homework for this uh, lecture, we're going to actually program this. We're going to do it two ways. We'll do it using nested loops, and then we'll use NumPy to do it using just one for loop. Uh, but this is easy to program. Uh, but the point of this lecture is to kind of understand the math and the intuition behind uh, this formula. Okay, so there's also the inverse discrete Fourier transform. Uh, it takes the Fourier transform uh, Fourier coefficient and convert it back. And this uh, this formula is given here just for completeness. We won't talk about this too much, but this is uh, the inverse of the discrete of the discrete Fourier transform. But this actually has some nice um, uh, applications, so I want to talk about that. Uh, and so because of this uh, uh, formula, we are able to prove a couple of uh, uh, facts. So the first fact is that if I take the Fourier coefficient and take the magnitude of it, this measure the magnitude of the frequency in a signal uh, through this equation. Uh, so a of k here is the amplitude of the sine or cosine function with uh, this frequency, f k. And so this formula says that, that the magnitude of the Fourier coefficient is proportional to the magnitude of the amplitude of the sine wave or cosine wave. So this is a this is a nice relationship that can help us recover the original uh, sinusoid uh, w with this frequency. In addition, if I look at the f again Fourier coefficient, but this time I take the angle or the argument of that complex number. Again, the magnitude is the square root of a squared plus b squared. It's just the distance from the origin. Uh, the complex number we can also compute the angle of the complex number uh, using this, for example the inverse tangent. Uh, so that angle indicates the phase of the sinusoid with that frequency. And that phase is in relation to the cosine function. Later when we do the example, we'll talk about uh, what that means. And so this says that uh, the, the, the coefficient tells us the magnitude and the phase of the sinusoid of a certain frequency. And, and as we know, that determines the sinusoid. And so this allows us to perfectly recover uh, the original signal, uh, again, provided that uh, everything is within the Nyquist uh, frequency. And so we're going to do an example, a detailed example of this uh, in this lecture so that we can really understand the full formulation of the discrete Fourier transform as well as the inverse. Okay, so here's a quick application of the inverse discrete Fourier transform uh, that we can, uh, can do. So as long as our original signal has no frequency component higher than the Nyquist frequency, then the inverse discrete Fourier transform allows us to perfectly reconstruct the original signal. And so this means that any signal is determined by the frequency content uh, of that signal. So, so this is uh, a bunch of application uh, of this fact. So here's some application. JPEG, MP3, and MPEG. Uh, 
uses the discrete Fourier transform to compress pictures, audio, and video files. So the way it works is that it actually uses a, a variant of a discrete Fourier transform. It only uses the cosine part of the discrete Fourier transform. Uh, but the point is here is that you take your image and you convert it into the Fourier coefficient. And the Fourier coefficient that are small, close to zero, you basically zero them out. So when you zero them out, you basically save some data. You don't have to remember those uh, small values. And then when you inverse discrete Fourier transform it, you get back a picture that is a compressed picture of the original picture. And so, so this technique is used for both JPEG, MP3, and MPEG files. So literally, whenever you go to a website and uh, the website displays JPEG, the website is literally doing uh, discrete Fourier transform, uh, uh, really cosine, uh, cosine of Fourier transform uh, on, on those uh, images. In addition, this can also help us filter out noise from, uh, from a certain uh, audio file. In fact, in one of the exercises for this lecture, um, there's a trumpet audio file with some high frequency noise. And then part of the problem is to kind of uh, filter out that noise and recover the original trumpet noise. It's really, really amazing that we can do this uh, with Python. And, and it's not even that hard. Literally, it's just like seven lines of code can, can do that. OK, so to understand the discrete Fourier transform, we have to understand something called the complex exponential. Uh, we remember the, comp uh, the exponential function, which is e to the x. That takes uh, looks like this. It takes a real number. Uh, what if we were to uh, allow this to take a complex number? Well, if z is a purely imaginary number, it has only the imaginary part, then we can show that uh, e to the i theta, again, this is a, a purely imaginary number, is cosine theta plus i sine theta. So this complex exponential is simply uh, this expression. This is actually known as Euler's identity. Uh, and uh, e to i theta is called the complex exponential. So for example, uh, e to i 0. So again, basically, uh, the, the number here to, after the i is the angle. And these complex exponential uh, are basically have length 1. So they all live on the unit circle in the complex plane. And so if you plug in 0 and you apply cosine sine, you get 1. If you plug in pi over 2, then you apply cosine sine, you get i. You can do this with, with any um, uh, purely imaginary number. Again, cosine pi over 3, i sine pi over 3 gives you this complex number. And so this is a complex number. And uh, because of the relationship sine squared plus cosine squared is 1, this complex exponential lives on the unit circle on the complex plane. So here's a picture for that. Um, and then uh, the way you visualize is that the, the, the theta is the angle of that complex number, and the magnitude of that complex number is 1. So all the complex uh, exponential lives on this unit circle on the imaginary uh, complex plane. So for example, these are a bunch of complex exponential. Again, they all live on the unit circle. Pi over 6 is the angle of that complex number. Pi pi over 3, right? So this is a positive uh, angle going counterclockwise. This is negative going clockwise. Um, so that's how you want to uh, understand these complex exponential. Complex sinusoids. Uh, in the first uh, lecture, I believe, or the second lecture, we talked about real sinusoids with a certain frequency f. So this is a nice way to, uh, to write um, a sine or cosine with uh, frequency factor out. So if f is uh, any number, then this function uh, has a frequency of f hertz, uh, similarly for the cosine function. Well, a is the amplitude. So this is real sinusoid. A complex sinusoid is very similar. A complex sinusoid with frequency f hertz has this form. It's e to the i 2 pi ft. So again, this is the complex exponential. And so um, so this has this form by applying the Euler's identity. And so a complex sinusoid is a complex value function. In other words, for every t, which is a real number, the output of a complex, uh, exp a complex sinusoid is a complex number. And so it has a nice uh, geometric interpretation to this. Uh, the way we visualize this is that as t go from 0 to infinity, this complex exponential stays on the unit circle, and it simply rotate on the unit circle at a rate of f hertz, or f cycles per second. Later, I'll show you an animation of this. Uh, but here's a, so if f is positive, then uh, it will be a counterclockwise direction. If f is negative, then it will rotate clockwise. So this is just rotating around a, the complex uh, unit circle at the rate of f hertz. So for example, here's a complex exponential. Um, 
So as t go from 0 to infinity, this rotate uh, 5 uh, hertz in the clockwise direction because this is a negative uh, frequency. And if this is a positive, then it will rotate 5 hertz in the counterclockwise direction. Okay, so, so one fact that we'll, uh, we're going to actually prove in the homework is that uh, if you look at the frequency of any real signal, it's symmetric around the, the origin, 0 hertz origin. Uh, so for example, if you have a frequency of f hertz that is in the signal, then the frequency of negative f hertz is also in that same frequency, in the same signal. So for example, here's a, a, a sum of three sinusoids. This one has a 1 hertz uh, frequency. This is 3 hertz, and this is 4 hertz. And so if I were to look at the spectrum or the frequencies in this si signal, obviously there's the 1 hertz signal, a 3 hertz signal, and a 4 hertz signal. What this says is that there's also a negative 1 hertz signal, a negative 3 hertz signal, and also a negative 4 hertz signal. And that the energy in, uh, in, in these, um, uh, these uh, the 1 hertz and the negative 1 hertz, for example, would be the same. So if I plot the frequency uh, of this, I get a, a symmetric picture. In fact, we did this in the first lecture. We read in uh, a C5 on a piano, and we saw that the frequency was symmetric around, uh, around 0 hertz. Okay, so let's now do a full example. Uh, we'll go through the entire discrete Fourier transform uh, formula and see how, uh, how this is done, and then talk about how, why this works. Okay, so here's the signal. It has a 10, 10 hertz uh, signal, amplitude of 3, and, uh, and then a 20 hertz signal, amplitude of 2. And this cosine function has a, a phase, so it's shifted over uh, by that phase. And this signal is only for a tenth of a second. We're going to sample this signal at a rate of 80 times a second. So every second we're going to sample it 80 times. Because we're only sampling it on a tenth of a second, that means we'll sample it for the total of 8 samples. Right? The rate times the length gives you the total of samples. So that means we'll sample this 8 times and uh, we'll call it Y0 all the way up to Y7. So there's our sampling. So this is our audio, for example. And then uh, the fundamental frequency right, is 1 over L. So L is 1 tenth. So 1 over 1 tenth is 10 hertz. Another way of doing this is to, to, to take the sampling rate divided by N. That will also give us 10 hertz. So that's the fundamental frequency. So, so the, the harmonics of that would be multiple of that fundamental, so 10, 20, 30, integer multiple of 10, all the way up to 70. So these are the frequencies that the discrete Fourier transform would try to detect. And because uh, we saw from before that the Nyquist frequency is 40 hertz, so what that says is that anything above 40 hertz we cannot detect. So we only can detect all the frequency from 0 up to the Nyquist frequency. So again, this is uh, talked about in the aliasing video, uh, lecture 3. And then all the frequencies that are above 40, they're basically a negative frequency. And because we saw earlier that, uh, that negative frequencies are symmetric, so we can basically ignore those frequencies. So really, the discrete Fourier transform, we're only interested in the frequency from 0 to the Nyquist uh, uh, frequency. OK, so here's the formula uh, for this example. This is the Fourier coefficients. There's eight of them k go from 0 to 7, uh, and y, y, y of n, the lowercase y, gives you the sample. These are the sample values of our signal. And then, so again, we want to understand the, ex, the complex exponential. If we can understand this, then we can understand why, why this thing works. Uh, and so it turns out that this uh, exponential, our uh, sample value from a complex sinusoid of frequency f of k. Okay, so let's see if we can try to understand that. OK, so the way we think about this is let's do uh, the first example. Let's find out what y of 1 is. So this is k is 1. And we're trying to find the Fourier coefficient of, of uh, y of 1. And again, I said earlier that this Fourier coefficient measures the degree to which the fundamental frequency of 10 hertz is present in the signal. We want to know how much of this uh, fundamental frequency is present in, in the signal. OK, so how does this work? Well, we look at the complex exponential, k is 1, so this is 1 right here, and n go from 0 to 7, so let's uh, list them out. So if I list out, if I plug in 0 to 7 into this complex exponential, we notice something very simple. These are, again, complex numbers on the unit circle in the complex plane. And notice that these are just rotating around the unit circle 
at a rate of uh, pi over four. This is just 40, this is pi over four. So we're just rotating um, by pi over four. And if I keep doing that, then I I get the. In fact, if I do that, I get the entire um, one cycle of that uh, rotation. So so again, I'm going from one uh, back to one again. And this is one cycle around a unit circle on the compass plane, because we're going one cycle around this plane, uh, this unit circle, in one tenth of a second. That's the same thing as ten hertz, and that's exactly the fundamental frequency. So the way we visualize this is that these um, numbers that are equally spaced around the complex num complex uh, unit circle, and they're rotating at a certain rate, and that rate is ten hertz. And so the discrete Fourier transform take those numbers and also take our samples and it's going to match them up and we're going to match them up by multiplying these guys so this times that, this times that you just multiply them, match them up and then we're going to add them together so the Y1 is simply the sum of of these uh, term by term products so the way you kind of think about this is that essentially we're trying to figure out whether uh, whether this uh, our signal how similar it is to this uh, frequency component. And so when we multiply this and add them together, we're measuring how similar our signal is in relation to the, uh, this uh, complex sinusoid with uh, the fundamental frequency. So again, we, we do this again for Y2. Y2 measure the, the degree to which the uh, F2, which is twice the fundamental frequency, so that's not uh, that's a typo, it should be uh, 20 hertz, so this is two times the fundamental frequency. Y2 measure uh, how much this frequency is present in the signal. So again, right, if I list out these numbers, now k is 2. And so if I pl plug in 0 to 7, I get these complex numbers. And if I look at these numbers, I notice that I'm actually going through these, I'm rotating at, at a rate of um, pi over 2 this time. And if I rotate uh, by pi over 2, then this will travel through the unit circle two times. And two cycles around unit circle in a tenth of a second, that's the same thing as 20 hertz, or 20 cycles per second. And so, again, we match them up, we multiply them, and then we add them. And so, you might recognize this, um, this calculation. If you've done pre-calculus, you might have uh, done the dot product. The dot product is actually when you multiply the uh, given two vectors, I multiply the corresponding entries. And then I sum them up. So this is actually just a, the discrete Fourier transform is simply a dot product. It's actually a general dot product called an inner product. But an inner product uh, basically measures similarity. And this is why the discrete Fourier transform works. It measures how similar our signal is to certain basic uh, frequencies. And that's how we can extract the content uh, of, our, of our signal. So let's see the animation of this. So I wrote a program in uh, Java here that kind of illustrate this. A little bit better. So at the bottom here is our sample y0 to y7, um, and uh, this is the compass plane. Right, this is a unit circle uh, on the compass plane, and these are the exponential. So the exponential are basically the the numbers that will be rotating around the compass plane. So for example, uh, let me uh, let's set this up. So so now let's look at the y1, the one we did earlier. This is y1. This measure how much the fundamental occurs in the signal. Okay, so now I'm gonna go around this unit circle, and as I go around it, I pick out complex numbers around this unit circle, and each of those numbers are multiplied by the corresponding numbers at the bottom. So as I go around, these numbers will go to the right. So for example, if I move it, so notice this move, this complex number, this complex exponential is multiplied by y1. If I move it again, you multiply this complex number by y2. So as I go through this, I notice that uh, the the frequency here is 10 hertz because as I go around around my, uh, my my samples, this will rotate around the unit circle exactly one time, or one cycle. One cycle in a tenth of a second is 10 hertz. That's a fundamental, fundamental frequency. Uh, and so, and then if I move up to 20 hertz, right, then that means again, I'm going to go through these samples, but this time it's going to go faster. My rotation will be faster, notice. And if I go through these numbers, notice that I will rotate around the circle exactly two times, or two cycles. Two cycles in a tenth of a second is 20 hertz. So this is exactly what the discrete Fourier transform does. It, um, let's do another one. This is a 30 hertz. So again, I'm going to rotate. And this time, I'm going to rotate faster. And as I go through these numbers at the bottom, 
and I again multiply these numbers with these numbers, I notice that when I get to the end, I will have rotated around the unit circle three times. So three cycles in the tenth of a second is 30 hertz. So that's, what, that's basically how, how we uh, compute those uh, coefficients. And then when I go to 40, same thing. Um, notice when I go to 50 though, 50 is higher than the Nyquist frequency. So 50 is actually is an alias frequency. And so 50 is actually the same thing as 30 hertz. Uh, and so uh, more on that when you watch the lecture 3. So that's, that's it. This is kind of an animation of see how it works. So if I do 50, for example, it looks like I'm actually going backwards. It looks like we're going negative, uh, negative 30, which is the same thing as positive 30. But okay, so let's go back. Okay, so that's basically kind of tell you how, how the DFT works. But I want to kind of uh, point out a couple of things. Uh, the dot product when we learn in pre-calculus, uh, measure similarity. So for example, if I have a vector here, uh, u, which is 1, 1, and then these three vectors, v1, v2, v3. If I take the product of u with v1, because u, v1 and u points in the general same direction, then v1 dot with u uh, should be a big number. But u is not pointing in uh, the same direction as v2, so when I dot product u with v2, I get a smaller number. And definitely u is very different than v3, so when I dot u with v3, I should get even a smaller number. So really, the dot product measure how similar a vector is with another vector. Again, if it's the same direction, the, the dot product gives you a big number, uh, etc. Uh, and so, when we look at, uh, so another way to think about this, the very geometric is, is that when we look at the, uh, the xy plane, for example, we have something called basis vectors. So u, 1, 0, this is 1, 0, and 0, 1. So those are called basis vector because those are the vectors, uh, you can think of them as like building blocks for every other vectors. In other words, every vector on the complex on the xy plane can be built up using u and v. So for example, if w is 3, comma 5, well 3 is, uh, 3, comma 5 is equal to 3 times u plus 5 times v. So that these two u, v vectors can build up any other vectors. So that's why they're called basis vectors. <coughs> and if I look at this picture, notice that the dot product tell you how much w, how much of w lives in u. So if I take u, w times uh, dot u, it tells me 3. So it says that um, u, uh, the amount u has some content in u, and that content is 3. And same thing, if I take dot product of w with v, again, it tells me how much of w lives in v. So the dot product tells you that is 5. So, so that's the component of w that is in v. And so, so basically the dot product is, is also known as the scalar projection. It, it tells you the components of, of an arbitrary vector in terms of the basis vectors. And, if, and so, so if you understand that, then, then the discrete Fourier transform is actually exactly the same thing. So in the discrete Fourier transform case, these sinusoids, right, these uh, sinusoids that we rotate around the unit circle, we saw earlier in the video, in the animation. So you think of this as the basis vector when I do the discrete Fourier transform, I'm actually taking, well, uh, well these basis vectors, uh, they give you, the, they kind of span the entire space of all the audio files, just like the basis vector from uh, the XY plane. So when I take the discrete Fourier transform, I'm taking the dot product of my audio signal, which is an arbitrary vector, and we want, and taking the product, I'm trying to figure out how much of the audio signal is present in uh, in the complex sinusoid of a certain frequency. So that dot product gives you the component of my audio file uh, in the direction of a certain frequency. So, so this is why the DFT can extract the frequencies, components, because the dot product is exactly projecting into those components. Just like this example, right, W has uh, is a uh, Three has a, a three component in the direction of u. When, when I project it, when I dot product, I get that component of w and u. In the same way, when I take the discrete Fourier transform, I'm taking the dot product of my audio file in the direction of a certain frequency sinusoid. So I'm asking, um, is there any frequency component of this arbitrary audio file in this direction? And, and that's why the DFT is a frequency extractor. And finally, I want to talk about the IDFT, the inverse discrete Fourier transform. Uh, 
uh, in the context of reconstructing the, the signal. So here's my original signal. We've done this already a few times in the first lecture. It will be the, one of the problems in the homework for this lecture. But we're going to sample this at a rate of 80 hertz uh, to get eight samples. Uh, if I do that, I get these eight samples. So uh, sampling this function uh, at this uh, rate for a tenth of a second gives us these numbers. The discrete Fourier transform convert that into uh, a Fourier coefficient. These are complex numbers. And I take the magnitude of those complex numbers. So magnitude of, of negative 12, i, for example, is 12. The magnitude of this is, again, square root of a squared plus b squared is 8, etc. So these uh, magnitudes tell us the components of certain, uh, of certain frequency components. So the way we saw was that the fundamental frequency here is 10 hertz. So 10, 20, 30, 40, and these are negatives. So for example, 12, what does 12 mean? 12 means that there is a frequency component of 10 hertz, and that component is proportional to 12. 8 means that there is a 20 hertz component, um, and then 0 here means that there is no 30 hertz component, there are no 40 hertz components. And that makes sense because from the original signal, we see that there's a 10 hertz component and a 20 hertz component. And the Fourier coefficient tells us that those are the components that are present in the original signal. Um, now, uh, again, we talked about how like these are just uh, symmetric, so we can just ignore those. Now, one way to ap apply the inverse discrete Fourier transform is just to apply the formula I showed earlier, and it takes these complex numbers back to these samples. But uh, but a better way, uh, another way that's kind of ge more geometric is to kind of uh, look at the coefficient that I mentioned earlier when we were talking about the inverse discrete Fourier transform. This is the this coefficient said that the magnitude of the Fourier coefficient is proportional to the amplitude of that sinusoid. So, for example, let's look at the number 12. If I take this 12 and plug into this equation, so 2 times 12 divided by 8, 8 is n, I get that the amplitude of, of this component, the frequency component, the 10 hertz component, is 3. And that's exactly right, because notice this is the number 3. We just uh, basically uh, found that uh, that's the amount of energy that's present in the signal of this frequency. So again, uh, let's try this again. Uh, uh, well, actually, let's try to find the angle. So the angle of this uh, Fourier coefficient is negative pi over 2. And that says that, uh, again, this is in relation to the cosine function. So this says that the sine function, if I start the sine function at negative pi over 2, actually, sorry, if I start the cosine function at negative pi over 2, that gives us the sine function. So the magnitude of the coefficient tells us the amplitude of the, the sine wave of that frequency. And the angle of that complex number tells us the phase in relation to the cosine function. Let's do this again for the other one. So again, I take this coefficient, 8, and I apply this formula, and I get that the number 2. Again, 2 is the amplitude of the cosine function. Uh, and then if I find the angle, the angle of the angle of this complex number is pi over 4. And so again, this is in relation to cosine. So notice that's exactly right. This cosine function has a phase of pi over 4. So, so that's how the inverse uh, discrete Fourier transform can perfectly reconstruct the original signal. Um, and, and the angle also tells you the phase, so together uh, it tells us the, the original signal. Okay, so this is the end of the video. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, so here again, that's all the great resources that you can read up if you want more information about this. Um, thanks for watching.